OK, let's try another attempt at a portable studio that is much more comfortable to sit at. I've borrowed a proper full-size Manfrotto uh, arm for from work. That allows me to actually hold the camera down closer to the table here. So what I have here is a Pifco, two uh, six-gang extension socket with surge protection. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, I think the surge protection will be the same. I should plug this in. Hold on, I will plug it in and we'll see the little indicator because I'm guessing this indicator is uh, partly power on, partly to show that the surge protection is in place. So I shall precariously plug it into where my lighting's plugged into here. And uh, can you see that? The little green indicator here has lit up. Excellent. Showing that the power is on and there's surge protection. Okay. Right. Let's see how easy this is to open up. I'm quite cautious here. Everything's a bit precarious. Everything's dangling. So if there's camera movement, my apologies about that. Uh, thankfully, they've not totally riveted it in. They are using triangular screws. So I shall pause momentarily while I... Uh, Take these screws out. This is so hard to open. I'm going to have to use the spudger to actually even open my screwdriver box. If I had fingernails, that would help. But I shall pause momentarily while I take the screws out. One moment, please. And the triangular bit didn't fit anyway, so I ended up just ramming this screwdriver down into it. This is a bit swamped now, isn't it? That's okay. It's an experimental studio setup with very strange lighting. So now I'm going to flip this over and take this cover off, if it's going to come off. Have I undone all the screws? Is there trickery? Oh, there are clips. Hold on. Oh, that's annoying. Uh, I may have to use unreasonable force again. That unreasonable force has worked again. Unreasonable force is amazing. Unreasonable force is not working right now. I will make it work. Even if it involves sudden loud crunching plasticky noises, is this going to be safe to use afterwards? No. Is it going to be used afterwards? Maybe not. Here is the safety shutter assembly off the British circuit. There is the surge suppression device, which has the one green LED. Um, and right, tell you what, tell you what, let's zoom down this for a start. I shall zoom down, making sure the camera doesn't wobble too much in the process. Oh, it is wobbling. Yes. Mm -hmm. We'll focus on that. I shall remove this. And I'll reverse engineer it and draw the schematic down. I'm already seeing a big improvement over others. I'm seeing a little gas discharge tube down here. Uh, right, tell you what, I shall uh, pop this out and reverse engineer it. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is a complete, let's explore. No glossy photo this time. None is needed because, well, this is good enough. What we have here are... Uh, a thermal fuse, the two metal oxyvaristors, another thermal fuse, and then the, another metal oxyvarister, and then the little gas discharge tube. I've identified them all. They're all standard components. The interesting things about this, there's three points that suggest this is a good design. First, it's got the gas discharge tube between the metal oxyvaristors and the earth. And the LED is surprisingly a bipolar green LED. It, operate, it lights in both the polarities. And it's got two 8th watt, 220k resistors in series. The net result is that uh, it passes about 0.5 milliamps, is fairly bright because it is a gallium nitride green, and these resistors are not stressed. This is good. Another nice design feature is that I've seen in previous units, they have the thermal fuse sandwich between the two metal oxide resistors. And in this case, they've got it on the outside, presumably for electrical separation, and therefore they've got two metal oxide resistors that are pressed against each other. The whole lot's sandwiched together with uh, heat shrink. Uh, the interesting thing is the two inside faces that are facing each other are both on the same polarity. I don't know if that's accidental or by design, but it does uh, mean that there's no potential difference to break down if any of the lacquer gets damaged with just heat and wear and tear. But this is the arrangement of these uh, metal oxide resistors, the fuses, the neutral, neutral, brown, brown, and then the earth and the earth just looping across to the gas discharge tube and then going to ground. If we take a look at the schematic here, you can see that live and neutral are immediately broken by the thermal fuses If in the case of overheating. And those fuses, if you look inside them, are a little block with the wire going in and then it's got that sort of what looks like that alloy stretch between it, a low melting point metal alloy. Well, I say low melting point, 115 degrees Celsius is the point it melts. But once uh, that temperature's reached this blob back, 
and it basically breaks the circuit. Normally, if those are intact, it shows that it is intact by lighting this LED with the two resistors in series and the two inverse parallel LEDs. The two inverse parallel LEDs means that um, it's going to effectively be brighter because it's not lighting half wave and also it's going to protect against uh, that reverse voltage damaging gallium nitride green LEDs because each one is capping the voltage across the other at a maximum of about 3 volts. If any of these thermal fuses does go, usually caused by one of the metal oxide resistors heating up because it's uh, gone into failure mode, which is how they tend to fail. If that happens and one of these fuses trips, uh, it will effectively turn the LED off. There'll be no uh, current path for the LEDs and it'll show that the unit is dead. Basically speaking, if the green LED goes out, even if your plug block is working, the protection has gone and you need to change that if you want more protection or add external protection. So the other two metal oxide resistors are between, la the main one is between live and neutral, the other two are between live and earth and neutral and earth, but there's also that gas discharge tube now. These metal oxide resistors, normally in the UK they're uh, labelled as say 14D471, uh, which means 14 millimetres diameter D for disc, and this is the voltage, so 511 actually means 5 110 volts, which is quite high. It's normally 470 volts. It's a little bit, they maybe just want to make it last longer. Give the other surge suppression equipment a chance to act first. But after that, we've got this gas discharge tube on the earth, which means it's going to add another 470 volts. That is a GN2R470, 470 volts, series A2L, and the A2L indicates the series and size, which is 5.5 millimetre diameter by 6 millimetre wide, and that provides that um, gap between these and earth, because some uh, of these surge devices simply have the earth connected here. And what that means is that as these fail, you can get increasing current flowing to earth, and it means that the earth goes open circuit somewhere, it poses a shock risk. Um, that is more or less it. That's all there is to say about it. But the main thing to say about it is that it is well designed and uh, it is a nice, solid, functional little unit, um, which actually is, is a very good thing indeed. But you'd expect that. PIFCO, let me see if I can grab that. PIFCO is a classic British brand. It's a, I'm not sure who owns the brand now, but in the old days, PIFCO was a, a famous name for electrical appliances and Christmas lights and things like that. Very collectible Christmas lights, if you have original PIFCO sets. But there we have it. The surge protective plug with its little module, its module is a really nice design. Good, solid design indeed.